Hello everyone, this is Sanjeev Goyal. Welcome to my show, Confession of a Futurist. Today I have a very special guest, Mr. Carl Mehta. Carl is CEO and co-founder of Edcast. Prior to Edcast, he has built a company called PlaySpan, which he sold it to Visa. He was also leading innovation at White House. Let's talk to him about not only the future of education, how can we apply a framework to build education for future? We all know our population is rising. We are expected to be 10 billion by 2050. Education is the key to our success. Welcome to our show, Carl. Okay, thank you. Let's talk about innovation framework and how can we build better infrastructure or better education infrastructure for our future? I know everyone worries about education as a parent. You're worried about your kids' education. We have to worry about our ed education. Or I used I like to use the word skills because uh, in our own uh, work, uh, wherever we are working, our skills are getting obsoleted very fast. There is a data or a study out there that every four years, 50% uh, of our skills are getting obsoleted. And this has just started happening in the in the past 10 years because of the internet, because of AI, because of machine learning, because of all this fourth industrial revolution and all that, the speed at which the jobs are replaced, replaced with machines, the speed at which new jobs are coming in and they require new skills, we all have to continuously upskill and reskill. It's almost like a car that you have to fuel and refuel continuously. It's the same thing with our brain now that we have to fuel and refuel. But uh, I think to coming back to your question about the innovation framework, how to reimagine the whole education industry. And as you mentioned in the previous Radio Zindagi program, right? It, uh, education is a huge industry, first of all. We all start from an investor standpoint. Uh, when, I, when I was a venture capitalist at, at Menlo Ventures, I learned the first question that the VCs think is the size of the market. Right? Yeah. And so you, if you look at the size of the market, education is huge. Um, yeah. In just in the United States, it is about two to three trillion dollars or roughly two trillion. Globally, it is about four to five trillion dollars industry. And uh, it's broken down. And that's in 10% of our GDP. 10% of our GDP, yes, absolutely. So uh, it's a very, very large market. Now, that's the good news. The flip side of being a very large market is that if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking, or if you're an innovator and you're thinking, okay, how do I innovate? This is so wide and so large canvas, you don't know where to start in you know, which part, because nobody, no one company or no one idea can address the entire thing. If, if an idea is trying to do that, it's a it's a bad idea, by the way, <laughs> so, right there. So I think the systematic way of thinking about innovating anything is to always break down things. It's just like how we have learned in our kindergarten school. If you want to learn, if you want to understand animal kingdom, you have to break down the whole animal, you know, hierarchy, right? And say, who is a reptile and who is an amphibian and all that. So same thing happens in the education space and you got to break it down and you understand, okay, there's K-12 market and there is a higher ed market and there is a workforce market. Now, those are the, the big picture, but then you have to further break it down in terms of the audience. It all starts the innovation framework, whether it is for education or anything, it all, the so, starting point is always the audience. The who. So let's talk about this a little bit uh, for a minute. So Carl, when we talk about framework, first we have to identify the stakeholders. Who are the key yeah. stakeholders and key people who needs to be on the table for us to define this framework. So students are definitely one, or learners, we call them, because now we are changing the skills, education with the skills. And I agree with you, this is the word of our skills, not education. Yep. Uh, so we have students and we have governments, we have state bodies, we have universities, we have businesses, we have entrepreneurs. So there is a pretty large spectrum of stakeholders who have to have or they have a buy-in or we require their buy-in to make it happen mm -hmm. so what are the four or three key stakeholders you would like to put on the table well i mean you can focus just on the one who is the learner because everybody else are enabler what you mentioned yeah the but the problem uh I'll, sorry to interrupt you learner has no say it's almost like healthcare system in america 
the patient has no say it's the <laughs> doctor and the insurance company let's let's be let's be real about it right right but but okay let me let me answer that so you're right the learner does not have a say in the k12 market okay as you go further i mean you are seeing even in higher ed you know whatever if they have some dispensable money you can get them to do if you have a compelling value proposition you will get them as a learner in the workforce again you're right that certain part of the spending is controlled by the employer who is willing to spend for the employee so you're right that the ultimate end user may not have a say but there is still a market where you can go direct to the employee or to a workforce individually but uh, yeah but that's a very narrow uh, car yeah. let's talk about the us 2 trillion dollar spend roughly on this yeah a majority of that goes to the universities yes private and partially yeah. to public when i look at the market even the employers are pretty much driven by the rules built by us or as a society 50 years ago if you are from stanford if you are from yale if you are from harvard you are better than anybody else and we both know we are in this world we fund these companies a lot of startups we are involved that's not entirely true but these institutions has become a great place because you get amazing talent and that's the reason throughput is amazing right the founders of google are from stanford so it's it's a phenomenal place to learn we are not discrediting any of these universities the challenge yeah. i am having even today is until we bring governments until we bring these uh, policy makers on yeah. the table it's not going to be solved because no matter what you and me will do we, the impact will be very little yes I mean, you're right no matter what edcast does even yeah. if once you become the google of education is still there is a legislature there is a government official he decide whatever kids are going to study not even in k12 even in universities one year they spend on journal ed i don't understand the purpose of that one even yeah 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 well no so way I, i like we do that yeah so look i mean it's a complex problem and the way i like to think is when i said learner it's actually more multi layer so at the layer 1 you need to focus just on the actual end user that's layer 1 now when it comes to getting the money paid for your value proposition to that learner there is a layer 2 if it is a k12 market it's going to be parent it's going to be school system if it is a higher ed it's going to be you'll have to sell to the colleges that has the money if it is a workforce you might have to go through an employer you might have to go through governments who are funding the investment into a learner into a workforce development so that i would consider as layer 2 from an innovation standpoint if you are an entrepreneur and we are thinking about hey how do i reimagine how do i reinvent so first you need to from a product standpoint i mean from product management discipline standpoint you need to start hey how can i make a learner's life really really good whether this person is in k12 or in higher ed or in a workforce what is the 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 fastest and the best possible way i can impart a skill in this person let's say if, i mean we'll, we'll take a simple example which in in silicon valley we'll, you know we always need more and more coding skills let's say let's pick that and we say okay you take a non coder who is making only 40 50k but if the moment you know coding you can literally double your income right he he can't even get for 90k today in silicon valley somebody who knows how to code in python right yeah. that's crazy so now the yeah, question is that to- okay If you want to really reinvent, reinvent, reimagine, just simple example is like, okay, I want to go after a market where I want to convert non-coders to coders. Boom! Mm-hmm. Clear ROI, clear doubling of the income, and that has been very That's successful. Carl, I yeah. really like that approach. So, yeah. as an entrepreneur, yeah. which we want to definitely uh, promote, because I honestly believe only entrepreneurs can fix this problem. Nobody yeah. else. So, if we focus on doubling people's income. so that should be the kpi given to yeah. anybody at least in the private sector that can you double the income of your users whoever is yeah. your user yeah is that absolutely. a fair statement yeah oh, absolutely and look people are motivated ultimately education or skills is a means to an end for most people unless you are a complete academic nerd and you are just learning for the sake of learning is there's only like 1 or 2% of the population on the planet the rest 98% has to bring uh, put the bread on the table has to pay the bills and so for them they directly equate and correlate and say what's going to make me more income 
only then I'm going to invest my time and money into education. So you're absolutely right that, you know, look, if you're an entrepreneur in education, the first thing to think about is that having that empathy, I think it all starts with your user empathy. That equation or that framework doesn't change whether you are in education sector or any sector. Any sector. No matter what you are becoming an entrepreneur in any sector, the first thing you start with is a user empathy which is the user audience where you feel really strong empathy and say, hey, these people are in pain and I want to alleviate this this audience pain. Like Travis Kalanick had his own pain where couldn't find a cab in Paris and then he invented Uber. Same thing, every every company goes to the exact same thing, which is saying that same either it is your own. Yeah. So either you have your own pain and you are able to extrapolate it and say, you know what, if I have this pain, a million other people has the same pain, or you just identify a group and say, if you're a parent and you say, look, you know what, I'm breaking my head against the wall with my high school kids. Those high school kids don't understand, let's say, finance. Why is no high school teaching personal finance? Why am I breaking my head in trying to teach my kids how to manage expenses, how to manage your pocket money? How, you know, don't overspend your, your parents' money, basic stuff. And, and somebody can come up with a billion dollars idea, which is saying, you know what, I'm going to teach finance to high school kids. Yeah. And it's a pain point, right? And, and, and students will pay for it, probably parents. I mean, parents will pay for it and say, you know what, like I'd rather pay $100 for a course that my kid will learn finance because they will that course will help my kids not waste my thousands of dollars later on or at least so, in the lifetime value of that learning is phenomenal phenomenal right so so i mean you asked the question about innovation framework i think it starts with the user empathy it's right. the next step is you know hey who is the sponsor of that user empathy it's if not the learner but the parent or the school the third thing is that you know okay what's the roi if even if the user and the parent pays for my product or service, what ROI are they gonna get? Are they gonna get a 10X ROI? If if I'm gonna make somebody spend $100 on my product or services, can they get $1,000? And how fast can they get that $1,000? And can they see it directly with a line of sight? If people don't see a line of sight ROI of 10X, they're not interested. Everybody's being bombarded with thousands of things. So, you know, look, um, it, it's your, our job to come up with ideas that gives that 10x ROI to people. And then you have to go out and, you know, really go after a narrow market and say, you know what, first I'm going to only pilot it in San Jose area or whatever, pick a, pick a city. Pick a and you say, I'm it's going to not, yeah, don't go broad, start small. And I think prove your results and then it kind of cascading effect is that the initial flywheel has to start flying and then it takes off. No, I completely, uh, I see what you're saying and I understand that when we talk about the framework to solve any problem, the big thing is systematic thinking. And what is that? If we start thinking in terms of ROI, it changes everything. Yeah. Because when you talk about 10X ROI, all of a sudden you start thinking solutions very differently. You may still solve the same problem, but you will solve it very differently. So, so let's talk a little bit more about this innovation framework or design thinking, or there are hundreds of words people are using nowadays to just uh, create this systematic thinking. But in reality, it is all systematic thinking to solve a problem. The problem is exponential. We want to provide exponential learning framework to our students in the end, because irrespective of uh, who are the stakeholders in the end, we need the whole society to alleviate to the next level. Yeah. So let's visualize 2050, 10 billion citizens of the earth. What you see or what change would you like to see in next 20 years? Sure. Well, first of all, all learning and skilling will be on demand, which is already the movement has started, but by 2050, it will be all on demand. Whatever you want to learn, you won't have to go physically drive or fill up a three page form to get enrolled. All that nonsense will go away. <laughs> and, and you know, if the Elon Musk company, the Neuralink, uh, you know, works out really well beyond the Alzheimer patient and all that stuff, maybe in 2050, you will be able to just inject from your computer certain skills like that Matrix movie. So maybe in 2050, we might be at that Matrix movie level where you know we will be able to inject skills right into your neurons. Uh, but if we don't get there, at least where we will get is that you, know, you will be able to uh, jump into any skills that you want to learn. You will be able to connect with the best expert in the world 
to be able to connect. Right now, it is very difficult. If I want to learn, uh, pick an expert, like uh, I want to learn golf from Tiger Woods, it's almost impossible. It's very expensive. I don't even know how to get to Tiger Woods and all that. I think in 30 years, we'll, we'll live in a world where everybody will have their virtual avatar, right? So there will be a virtual and avatar of Tiger Woods. Knowledge. And, and yeah, and Tiger Woods will show up on my screen and he will be teaching me golf, right? And he will and give you personalized guys. instructions because this exactly. is all AI driven. So AR, AI driven and AR That's augmented perfect. reality, virtual reality, I will be in a 3D golf uh, course standing right next to Tiger Woods and actually in Tiger Woods voice and Tiger Woods AI will be telling me exactly how to hit the ball. So how I think about, we'll get... Uh, how about even uh, having uh, augmented clothing in this? I'm just trying to visualize this problem because this is a very good problem you brought up. Yeah. My t-shirt has the sensors and if yeah. my body moves in really differently, it kind of trigger that, hey, no, you are supposed to keep this hand like this. You have to keep your arms leg, exactly. your waist straight, move, and, and it straight. kind of give you a nudge. So your movement improves yeah. over the time. Exactly. It's the IoT. So then, yeah, you, so you will have AR, VR, you will have AI, ML, you have IoT, and all those things come together, maybe somewhat Neuralink. You will be able to learn golf 100x faster than you are able to learn today. And you can actually improve your golf skills in, in two months that it takes today, 20 months of playing to improve your golf skills. I see, definitely see your point. And uh, Neuralink, I'm a big fan, but I'm not really sure if that's going to happen uh, for this kind of purpose. And I don't want to inject I, something in my brain, right? <laughs> right, right. So that's something I, but I do see, which I didn't, I was not able to connect earlier when you talked about this problem and systematic thinking and for our audience, we just took one use case. Carl and me were not prepared for that, golf. And he and me started collaboration. Yeah. And this is exactly what institutions does today, universities yeah. does. They create this collaborative environment where yeah. students sit together and solve a problem. And yeah. that is what, Carl, we need to figure out, people yeah. like you and me, how do we create that environment in a virtual space, which feels almost real, that we are solving a real problem. Yeah. Uh, like I can clearly see you need a IoT guy, you need a fabric yeah. guy, you need a, a guy who doctor type person who understand the body, body movement, so he can talk about the triggers, how it moves, yeah. because sensor put here and there and all that, it can be very different. And then we need expert who are constantly digitizing all the shots of Tiger Woods and how Tiger Woods get the best game. And then yeah. when you are practicing at yeah. your house with a VR headset and a VR yeah. golf club, it changes everything based on how Tiger Wood will hit it. And at the same time, it will, oh, how Jack Nicholson is going to hit it or how yeah. someone else is going to hit it and yeah. how your body changes with that. That yeah. will be an interesting problem, actually. And yeah. I think that is what the problem it is. A, it is definitely a multi-billion dollar uh, problem to solve. Yeah. And look, this is going back to your word about exponential. So look, the exponential is that today, any skill that you want to learn, if it is taking you 12 months to learn a skill, can we compress it down to one month? Nice. Can we compress it down to one week? And imagine the human, the human evolution and the human advancement Today, all of us are stuck in our ability to learn and the speed of learning. Uh, Carl, I can talk to you for hours, but this is a brilliant example. I think uh, we should really think about yeah. how do we create these kind of uh, framework and share yeah. with our audience and the people around us. Yeah. How can they learn anything? Yeah, absolutely. Learn anything and, and in the fastest possible time. That will be amazing world. That's I exciting. Completely. It is exciting. Very exciting. It is definitely yeah. exciting. And you gave us a brilliant idea to all of our audience. Golf is a great game. Uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that billions of dollars has been spent on golf yeah. every yeah. single year. So it's not a small, small industry. And so yeah. is the whole sports, whether it is uh, uh, hockey or it is football or any soccer or any other game. There yeah. is a huge uh, opportunity for us yeah. to change the way we play and we enjoy life. In the end, it is all about how we live our life. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Carl, I can't thank you enough for your time. It's just phenomenal to talk to you and thank you very much for taking time today. For well, us. Likewise, it's uh, always audience. a pleasure to talk to you. So happy to uh, to connect anytime. Thank you.